called the Big Hand. So you're keeping the time, Alex, right? Yes. Huh? Okay. So um, thank you, Alex, for this generous introduction. And um, just a word uh, about Turkey. Yes, I mean, Boğaziçi University is, I think, making history um, now because the uh, resistance to an appointed director, the rector was appointed against the will of the faculty by President Erdogan, has been going on for two and a half years nonstop right now. Right, nonstop. Um, and I think this is the longest academic struggle ever to be waged. Um, so wish us good luck because we see no end in sight. Um, but my talk will not be on Turkey. Um, it is a, a situated question that I'm asking. I am asking my question um, departing from my situation in Turkey as an activist, as um, I will also um, uh, uh, say words uh, about a few words about uh, in a minute but it is a more general question that i want to pose and please bear with me because this is a working paper this is a question that i've been throwing around for more than a year now i haven't produced anything written on it so i'd be very glad if we can have a lively discussion do criticize me do bring all your questions it would be very helpful for me as well so now the talk. Um, in 1954, in her quest to understand what had happened to her own country, Germany, during the rise to power of one of the most murderous regimes in history, Hannah Arendt remarked that, I quote, the very event, the phenomenon with which we try and must try to understand has deprived us of our traditional tools of understanding. The event she was referring to was totalitarianism, that is, Nazism and social Stalinism, whose elements she believed now existed in all free societies. I wanted to begin my talk with Arendt, since she was a thinker who emphatically underscored how understanding affects our capacity to add something of ourselves to the world. Understanding is not a passive faculty. Arendt associated understanding with awareness, with perspective, with the construction of meaning, without which we fail to reconcile ourselves with what we do and what we suffer. Implied is that only understanding can overcome resentment. And that's where you come in, Professor. So I'd like to you know, talk more about that. Um, uh, can overcome resentment, the curse that drags us down into animosity or denial, thereby hampering our capacity to act freely, to bring something new into the world. Without understanding, we are but strangers without a sense of direction. Being robbed of the possibility to understand and communicate our experiences is tantamount to being robbed of our past as well as of our future. The experience of totalitarianism not only produced what she called world alienation, but it also removed the conceptual and practical banisters, the, the rails, um, upon which we used to lean when finding our way around. And yet, Arendt retains her hope. We must now act and think in a gap, she says. In the gap opened between a past that we cannot fully grasp and a future that is not traced by belief in progress or in the inevitable march of history. So 70 years after Arendt's premonitions, I feel the urge to ask whether the metaphor of a gap would still be appropriate in accounting for what I consider as our drastically different relation to time. I cannot claim that I understand the world in which we live, nor can I ascertain with confidence 
that the past and the future are temporalities that have any bearing on the present anymore. For what is that present? Is it a gap, a spatial opening within time? Or are we squeezed? Are we squeezed in like the Angelus Novus, dear to Walter Benjamin? Let me just quote the, the, the part I find very relevant in Benjamin as um, a thesis on history. His, on Angelus Novus, right? His face is turned towards the past. Where we perceive a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed, but a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such a violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. The storm is what we call progress." Unquote. Today, it seems that no wind of progress is blowing from paradise to project us into the future. We seem, on the contrary, to be regressing, and regression is a, a, a category that comes up in um, critical uh, theory, especially Frankfurt School analyses these days. Um, we seem, on the contrary, to be re regressing into a time foregone. But neither can the past be said to push us back. Instead of preparing for flight, it seems that we are sinking into the debris piling up under our feet, uh, stuck in a present that is filled up in such a way that it shackles us into the now. So with Francois Hartog, a French philosopher, I'm worried that presentism, that's a neologism, right? Presentism is the predominant structure of temporality in the age of authoritarian neoliberalism. And that this significantly reduces our chances of resisting the status quo. Let me be more precise and describe to you the concrete background of my concerns. That's the situated question. That's, that's the situated um, stance that I have. So I do stand before you not only as a scholar, but as an activist who has repeatedly suffered defeat in the face of a strong man who as we call them today, an authoritarian leader who musters support from the majority of the population, despite high levels of corruption, despite arbitrary rule, despite the mismanagement of the economy and the reckless urbanization projects that were responsible for the devastation caused by the earthquakes um, this past February. To say the least, the months leading up to the presidential and parliamentary elections in Turkey were frantic. The ruling government's irresponsible slowness in dispatching relief operations uh, to the earthquake zones in February obliged individuals and civil society actors, all of us, to spend all of February organizing search and recovery missions, delivering food and supply to the earthquake zones with whatever means we could, and spending hours on the social media to relay distress messages to whomever was in a position to assist. The election date was announced early March, and immediately afterwards, activists supporting the opposition started worrying about electoral uh, candidates and alliances. Posts about the earthquake disappeared almost overnight from the social media. Knowing that the opposition in its more or less democratic forms in Turkey, there are less democratic forms of opposition, uh, was not well prepared for the elections, individuals as well as civic platforms were now busy organizing volunteers to monitor the ballot boxes or working with the uh, candidates for the campaigns. This lasted until the elections on May 14th. When it became clear that a runoff would be held two weeks after the first round, social media users as well as opinion leaders engaged this time in a frenzied effort 
to call on voters not to give up, to go to the polls another time. The runoff was held on May 28, and the results came in. We realized soon that our hopes were dashed, our hopes for change were dashed. We were just starting to sink into deep melancholia when Erdogan delivered his victory speech. He chose not to adopt a reconciliatory tone, the one that would expect of a for, from a president elected for the third time and entering his third decade of rule. Far from it, he announced that his party was preparing immediately to win the municipal elections to take place in March 2024. That, that evening, he announced that. I didn't write a single academic line for four months. And if it weren't for this conference, I wouldn't have written or continued writing this paper. I think you get the message. Time never stops under fascistic authoritarian neoliberalism. There's always another battle to be fought, even for the victorious and the powerful. There's, and as for the targeted, those targeted by repression, they can neither hope nor can they afford to lose hope. So presentism corresponds, in my mind, to the state of being caught up in an eternal present, a sort of non-redemptive eternal return, without any respite or pause that would allow us to face up to past events or to imagine alternative futures. So the main focus of this talk will be this peculiar future of temporality that other scholars, um, uh, other than Francois Artaub, uh, describe through other neologisms, such as the time-space compression, David Harvey, or acceleration of time or speed, uh, Paolo Virilio, uh, or Hatmut Rosa. I claim that by whatever name we call it, changes in the structure of temporality should be of concern to us because it is one of the most overlooked factors in analyses on contemporary forms of authoritarianism, fascism, or populism. In this talk, I'll pinpoint three major changes that I find particularly pertinent, although there is much more to be said on this uh, matter, of course. So one, um, innovations in digital technology, as we know, it has been studied uh, a lot. Two, neoliberal economic policies, and lastly, I will talk about the, the relationship to temporality of populist authoritarian dispositives. Uh, just a word about why the acceleration of time is puzzling in the conceptual sense before I begin. Now, when considered as a universal convention that is defined as objective, time does not progress faster. If our day is still 24 hours, hopefully, and an hour is still 60 minutes, and if our clocks don't turn faster, the question we should ask is, what experience does accelerated time correspond to? Is this a matter of perception? Or has there been a metamorphosis in materi materialist practices that fill or surround objective time? <coughs> Another question concerns what acceleration has to do with presentism, the predominance of the present, the now. So let me begin the first point about digital technologies. Let me begin with Henri Bergson, for whom it is impossible to live in the now. Just to recall his analysis, Bergson uh, claims that duration, durée in French, is not made up of hours. Uh, but of perceptions of the past, present, and future that are in a state of perpetual transitiveness. According to this understanding, the past, present, and future are quantitatively, quantitatively sorry, inseparable from each other. They are a qualitative continuum as the color spectrum. The present is what reconstructs the past and the future as it unfolds. So it's a continuum. We can't, I mean, every break we uh, uh, announce in time is an artificial break, it's an artifice, right? Uh, 
Uh, but the present is impossible to experience because it is the most transitive, the most fleeting of durations. But then, what would Bergson have said if he were to learn that today we've invented a duration called real time? A temporality that is supposed to fit, uh, suppo supposed to fit, fit sorry, multiple present moments into the same moment. Real-time information transfers, as we know, with simultaneous interactions between bodies located at a distance from each other, like we've done on Zoom. Uh, the invention of smartphones and developments in communication technologies give rise to live streaming possibilities that nullify space and enable us to both be here and there, here and not here at the same time. In other words, we are surrounded by equipment that enables us to experience what others are experiencing, even though their now does not annul our now, but is seemingly synchronized with it. By way of contrast, I know this is very um, naive, but just, let's just contrast the era in which the print media was the only source of information the younger um, attendants here would not remember those times. Right? Due to spatial constraints, um, real-time interaction, interaction could only occur when individuals came together physically to interact. News of, uh, uh, of events reached individuals gradually and in fragmented form through mediations, not immediately as they unfolded. In ontological terms, this resulted in differing, différence, I use it in the Derridian sense, differ, differ, uh, differ and differ, differ meaning delaying the effect that information had on cons consciousness, and this prolonged the time between stimulus and signification, action and reaction. The differing produce an espacement, a spacing, as Derrida would say. That is, the production of intervals in the literal sense of the word, within which not only synchrony but also diachrony can take place. With the introduction of inter internet technology and smartphones into our lives, however, our present time compels us to respond to several interpolations transmitted from different places at any given moment, producing several layers of uh, synchrony that demand several simultaneous modes of present or presencing. This is exactly what Instagram's Insta heralds, share instantly, get instant reactions. The mobile phone, which has become a prosthesis of the body, it's like our hand is, Miss, is missing something if it, we don't have the, uh, it in our hand. Um, uh, this allows transcendence or difference, instead inviting us to consummate several lives all at the same time. Our physical life, biological life, a virtual life, the lives of others that we know, and the lives of others that we don't know. By the same token, our memory is pressed to hold multiple present times in store. So on the one hand, our finite spatial existence, for example, our presence in this hall, right, is woven with face-to-face -face interactions and experiences, but the, on the other hand, the moments of those who are not here are constantly making demands on our present. Perhaps this is why we will have to reconsider Marshall McLuhan's famous global village uh, metaphor. The world does not seem to be shrinking, I claim. On the contrary, exponentially multiplying spaces and temporalities are compressed into the present. There is a tension, a tension, a desynchronization between the flow of physical time, my bodily time here, and the flow of virtual timelines. With Hartmut Rosa, we can claim that the acceleration of time 
does not guarantee that we're actually going anywhere. As with the mouse in a wheel, you know, the mouse um, sort of love running in place in a wheel, we might be staying in the same place even as we are running. The reason why we must multitask today is to keep up with heightened demands on our time. As we struggle to meet these demands, however, new ones appear. As soon as one task is completed, another begins. In other words, there is no pause, no experience of closure or accomplishment. Although the mouse wheel appears like an appropriate metaphor, I personally prefer, prefer Zeno's paradox of the non-advancing arrows, the ancient Greek paradox. Um, um, if you remember, I mean, Zeno's question, paradoxical question is the arrows don't move because each instant they are in a fixed place and therefore they will never um, uh, uh, come to the target. The complexity of the current period lies not so much in the multiplication of tasks, but in excessive data and information that divide our attention and divide the, uh, our uh, activities into those activities in which we are multitasking uh, and those activities in which we barely find the time to reflect on what we are doing. Um, but the instantaneous, this is the, the, the catch here. What is instantaneous is not meaningful in itself. In Zeno's paradox of uh, arrows, the sequencing of moments in chronological time is not enough for a movement to occur. In other words, the result of the sum of nows is not a continuous story. A meaningful narrative is only possible if every moment were knitted into a whole textualized and contextualized. And a future is only possible if there is hope that such stories can be written. So this pushes Paolo Virilio to think that we are living in a claustrophobic uh, universe that fails to generate meaning. Um, I want to skip a bit the technical parts, but I. I don't want to bore you to death. There are other people who are writing about this. For instance, Werner Stiegler. I think there was a, um, a presentation on Stiegler here in this. Yes? Okay. So, <laughs> um, so um, I mean, the, 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 the idea that Stiegler uh, sort of um, plays around with is that, you know, the, the spirit, there's a crisis of spirit um, today. And that crisis, it's a Hegelian conception, of course, that crisis is also a crisis of history because history has ceased to be intelligible. Um, so without elaborating these points and leaving these points to the uh, Q&A, I just want to note that, um, uh, that what we call post-truth today might in be, indeed be the outcome of the transformation undergone by our regimes of temporality. Just as the succession of nows doesn't add up to make a story, as Virilio emphatically underlines, neither can they constitute what we might call factual truth or any other form of truth. The fate of the past is similar to that of truth. Both today are ineffective. So although the second, uh, let me go on to the second point. Now, although I strongly agree with um, this analysis of digital technologies and their effects on our um, uh, uh, on temporality and our relation to time, I am skeptical concerning the idea that digital technologies can be both poison and medicine, pharmacon. 
The reason for this lies not so much in the nature of technology, but in neoliberal governmentality. That is, in practices that actually steer today's technological and algorithmic developments. To be sure, we also use digital technologies for resistance, but we tend to forget that they respond first and foremost to the needs of capital. So let me just briefly unpack this economic dimension because I find it very important. We might want to ask what effect the neoliberal economic model which has imposed uh, uh, on most of the world from the late uh, 70s onwards has on temporality. The first effect I would like to mention um, would be that it eliminated the institutional and legal arrangements that secured the future. This has been the case uh, in Turkey, but in this conference I'm learning in a lot of other countries, right? Um, uh, uh, before the neoliberal turn, permanent employment in the private and public sectors, guaranteed retirement schemes, social state provisions, rule of law and constitutional rights tended to limit the uncertainties attached to the future. In their place, we now have precarious and flexible work conditions, performance criteria and private retirement funds. These, what effect do these have on the future? Well, they significantly reduce the predictability of the future. Flexibility makes work dependent on the present time. Likewise, performance criteria are dispositives that attach the future to one's performance in the present. Our capacity to design or predict the future has therefore been tied to the now. And yet the now is not the yet side that Walter Benjamin hoped would blast open empty homogeneous time. It seems to me that while time is indeed homogeneous, its emptiness has been reconfigured. Capital has acquired the capacity to manage the now, of bonding the future with the present, such that time is no longer a continuum that can be blasted open. One impediment to action in any potential yet, yet sight, you know, the now, the Benjamin now, and I know this argument will be very spurious, right? I mean, this is the part when I'm, when I'm not really sure of, so. Uh, one impediment to acting um, and opening up a revolutionary um, uh, uh, potential, uh, using time as kairos in the Greek sense, that is a moment where uh, 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 continuities can be inflected and um, uh, a new future can be opened up, an occasion. Uh, so one impediment is the subordination of industrial capital to financial capital. Now, what has that got to do with time? Well, this makes the short-term profit drive the norm. As we know, the transaction speed in the financial sector is extremely high. Unlike in industrial production, action, reaction, and profit loss in the finance sector is instantaneous. It cannot be postponed. Financial capital is subject to sudden fluctuations and is therefore extremely short-sighted. And we know that in our daring age, large corporations are also geared according to financial goals. In other words, the present moment, which Baxson uh, considered unlivable, and that Arendt as well as Benjamin imagined as the time of action, that produces a difference has become a crucial segment of time that capital must now successfully manage. Both industrial capital and finance capital have acquired the skills necessary to control the present. The future is curtailed not only by the speed of algorithms, but also by the speed of capital. Unfortunately, the story does not end there. 
Neoliberalism is not only an economic strategy, but also a form of sociality that includes the mobilization of affects such as desire, fear, and anxiety. Michel Foucault's concept of security, developed in his 1977-78 lectures, oh, rain, alarm, see, simultaneous time. <laughs> Is there an alert? Hmm? Oh. <laughs> that's not that's not a worrisome thing. We're inside. We'll worry later. We'll worry about that when we grow up. This. So uh, Michel Foucault's concept of uh, security um, successfully accounts for how neoliberalism uses risk management methods at the level of population. I previously wrote about it, so I won't go into it, but I'm glad to respond to any questions um, concerning this in the Q&A. Um, the risk management uh, methods at the level of population, uh, in my view, um, are very important in understanding not only how biopolitical um, uh, uh, you know, um, securitization works, but in how new mechanisms are developed that at attach us uh, and grasp us from, begin from within and captivate us uh, without the use of force. And that uh, in the last panel was also, uh, uh, there was a question um, concerning whether political repression uh, or whether economic um, sort of uh, uh, mechanisms uh, were more fearsome for the working class. Apparently, the economy is more captivating. Economic um, mechanisms are more captivating than um, political um, police force or the uh, threat of sanctions, right? Um, so let me exemplify this through the notion of um, guilt. Uh, in German, Schuld, guilt, uh, means both debt and guilt. So debt has become one of the most important tools deployed by capital to control individual su subjectivities, as we know. Uh, and as well as the fate of um, whole national economies. The neoliberal financial economy is a debt economy. But the most important temporal impact of debt is that it holds the future in pledge as a sort of hostage. This adds a new dimension to presentism. The debt we will reimburse in the future becomes a constant source of guilt weighing on the present. Individuals have to integrate the, uh, the future into the present because they must at all costs avoid the burden of failing to honor the debt. Note that no one is forcing anyone to take out a loan. The movements of the population in this Foucauldian scheme are directed by dispositives such as the availability of uh, loans, the availability of credit cards, but also in countries like Turkey, the availability of paying in installments, like you can pay um, in 10 months or um, six months' time. But that's a certain debt structure, right? Uh, so these dispositives that induce a desire in consumption and make loans available to individuals. But on the other hand, there's the anxiety induced in individuals as a result of taking these risks. So we start identifying with capital, begin to see it ourselves through its eyes. We look at ourselves uh, through the eyes of credit or loan uh, 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 giving uh, institutions. We determine whether we are credit worthy or not. 
Moreover, the anxiety is deepened by the fact that debt cannot, can now be traded in the com as a commodity. Uh, as you know, um, assets have ceased to become uh, the primary uh, profit-making instruments in the financial sector. Debt and mortgages have become more profitable. They are sold and bought on the uh, financial uh, market. But what does that mean? That means that uh, our future becomes dependent on a set of algorithms that no single actor can fully control. And our future through these algorithms is bought and sold by many actors who cannot be traced back Remember the, the uh, 2008 um, sort of uh, crisis, financial bubble in the US? There was nobody who was responsible for the crisis. The, the money had changed so many hands, which means that there are forces determining our future that act as externalities over which we have no control, but that can in any second make us lose our homes, savings, reputations, livelihoods, and honor. So the issue of control is important in that it partially explains the appeal of strongmen. You are wondering how I was going to, I guess, tie this, all this to uh, the political question. Because the strongmen, the authoritarian leaders, the fascistic uh, populist um, uh, campaigners, they offer ersatz or, you know, pseudo forms of control over our lives. I'm not saying, of course, that authoritarian leaders have appealed because of algorithm rhythms or financial markets. Nor are the latter the sole culprits of loss of control. You know, in neoliberal times, we don't have control over cl climate change, over levels of pollution, etc. But um, uh, the, the, the feeling of helplessness and the res ressentiment or resentment greeted by the lack of control may very, very well be channeled into a will to power by right-wing forces that not only excel in exploiting ressentiment, but are also masters of storytelling, even if their stories are spun by spin doctors. And therefore, one of the disturbing questions I have is, at the same time as we lose our capacity to write stories or to bring the nows into a meaningful story, isn't that lag actually feeding into right into the hands of authoritarian leaders who have become the storytellers of a different future, of a future that will make people great again with control over their destinies and whether this shouldn't be taken into consideration when analyzing authoritarianism. So if I have five minutes, do I or no? Two? Five? Okay, great. So let me come to this last point because that's where why you have been patient all this time. Um, I mean, one the political um, aspect of presentism is what uh, uh, I think escapes um, the attention of most scholars. Right? Um, they are attentive to digital technologies. They are attentive to neoliberal temporalities, but I think in in, in, in my view, um, they hesitate to associate neoliberalism with authoritarianism on the one hand, and to conceive of 21st century authoritarianisms as forms of rule that accelerate time. They are forms of rule that necessarily mess up with temporality. Right. So looking at authoritarianism through that perspective, I think, would be um, important. To put it briefly, I adamantly believe that authoritarianism is built into neoliberalism. I know I disagree with you, Mark. 
So I think the, the, the neoliberal rationale upholding authoritarianism is evident in its favoring efficiency over equality. It doesn't even use the word equality anymore, right? Equity. Technocratic rule is preferred to participatory governance. Private charities and self-help mechanisms to social welfare provisions and opportunity cost calculations to constitutional rights. The neoliberal turn was not a soft one, as some scholars tend to think. For more than 50 years now, the implementation of neoliberal norms across the globe has entailed violence and coercion to eliminate the obstacles in the way of the new regime of accumulation. And you know Turkey is one of those countries in which neoliberalism was established through a military coup after Chile. After 73 in Chile, it was the 1980 Turkish coup. But what about acceleration? What does all this have to do with acceleration? In my view, Arendt can be of help to us here again. So Arendt's analysis of totalitarianism, which I talked about lengthily elsewhere, if, um, I'd be glad to sort of you know, send you this, the paper. Um, but um, just want to summarize here. She analyzes totalitarianism um, by looking also at the temporal conditions it induces. Totalitarianism differs from dictatorship, and I think I would like to insist on this. Totalitarianism, dictatorship are two forms of rule. Dictatorship being a fixation, a stabilization of the regime, Whereas totalitarianism being a flexible and ever-changing, mobilizing, fluid regime. So when we think of totalitarianism as something that fixates, what we have in mind is actually dictatorship. That's what I um, sort of deduce from Arendt. Uh, the specific novelty of totalitarian rule is its capacity to destabilize, not stabilize, but destabilize frames of reference and class-based ideologies and provide a fictive home as a point of affective attachment for the masses. Total power is exercised by filling up with movement any moment of inertness that could otherwise have allowed for a temporal gap within which reflection could take place. This form of power is in perpetual motion instead of being rigid. Uh, but what can we say about, um, um, I mean, I wanted to quote Arendt, but I would, for you at this time of the day, you are um, very tired, as tired as I am. So for those who want the quote, I can send it by you. Um, so if um, we continue talking about how fascist slash authoritarian uh, leaders um, utilize time, I would like to add that or underscore that they recreate durée, duration. They relink past, an imaginary past, a mythical past, albeit, it's a past, the present, and a more mythologized, heroic uh, 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 sort of future. So they knit the story uh, or the the um uh, elements of durée that Baxon was talking about together. We know uh, that they cannot offer for real action, a real action that is inventive and creative and that would blast open uh, uh, the domination structures uh, of our times. But they induce their followers to believe that the moment has come, Kairos, Yetzite, so it's a pseudo Arzatz Yetzite, right? To walk in uh, the, the doors of history and write history once again. 
to make America great again, to make Turkey new Ottoman, right? To make Korea, I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're not there. Uh, so they are the prophets. The prophets of deceit, as Leo Lowenthal and um, Norbert Gutermann of the Frankfurt School um, wrote once about the fascist leaders, they are prophets of deceit. They do deceive. They lie all the time. But they are prophets. So the question that I want to end with, and I will end with a question. I'm very sorry about that. I have no answers. Uh, the question I want to end with is, what story do we tell? What story are we capable of telling? Now, let me talk for myself. We, as in the Turkish opposition, democratic, more or less democratic, radical, not feminist, Kurdish, uh, LGBTQI, uh, etc. We have no story of utopia to tell, but dystopia. Right? We have tra tragic stories to tell. We think we are pulling the alarm. Uh, that was the brake that will stop the train. But actually, that alarm adds to the anxiety and the sense of helplessness um, that the populations actually feel. But I think there's something more important, and I uh, really want to open this up to discussion. I think not only do we not have a story, but we don't have any space spatial setting or spatial mechanism that would allow for a renewal of face-to-face -face interactions with a populace that does actually get crushed under not only um, authoritarian domination, but also neoliberal economic extractivism. We cannot relate to them there are no spaces in which we encounter them. There are no spaces in which we can, through interaction, build that power, the power from below that would actually enable us to create the real yet side, the real moment of action. The, uh, the left in Turkey has lost its associations, um, neighborhood associations, unfortunately. There are formal structures, there are formal parties. Unions still have a power. Professional associations um, have power, but there are no spaces of congregation in the neighborhoods. Whereas, what does Erdogan do? What does the right wing do? They go to the mosques. They establish charity foundations, you know, charity associations. Through a lot of conservative foundations, they go out to the poor. They go out to the uh, suburbia. Uh, they go out to the working class um, in uh, the urban settings. In these spaces of congregation, cell phones are turned off. Face-to-face -face interaction can take place. And so my question is, if you identified with my talk, then probably you're not part of that crowd or that, mm, let's say, basis, popular basis, for whom cell phones might not be that important. You might be part of this urban activist, intellectual, social media user that I am for whom time has accelerated. And so perhaps this story that I'm telling does not hold for others in more rural, rural settings or that are part of, for instance, housewives. Women voted for Erdogan, although he has moved out of the Istanbul Convention against the prevention of violence against women. And although he promises to go back to a times when women did not have rights, did not have so much to say, 
Why? Because housewives perhaps are not on the phone all the time and are not caught in this trap that I've been just talking about. I know this is like a deconstructive effect, but I want it to be so. Um, and perhaps those uh, uh, parts of the population um, are uh, the, 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 um, the, the power bases that we are lacking, but that we cannot um, reach out to. Right. So I think I'm going to end this talk with a paradoxical suggestion. In order to stop this eternal return of the now, maybe we do not have any temporal strategies, but maybe we should rethink our spatial strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very impressive and then uh, quite provocative. And then also, I got a lot of you know, the question and then comment. And then uh, I must preserve you know, my own for the dinner time. And then I think you know, Jainab's, uh, what Jainab uh, was taking is uh, quite you know, perfectly uh, how you know, cuts out for this uh, topic, other term. And then Actually, the, when you describe the, what happened in Turkey and then uh, the end of your talk is a quite similar, well, a little bit actually kind of a uh, uh, mirror image to the current current government, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's government attacking uh, trade union and workers, and then uh, actually the, also they try to establish you know, the foundation for protecting pet. For protecting? For, Pet, pet. Uh, dogs and cats. Oh. And then uh, some sort of uh, it's very interesting. Uh, yeah. What's a human? You know, it's how? Sort of, uh, <laughs> and then actually they believe themselves kind of liberal, you know. And then uh, also the existing uh, freedom of uh, some middle class. We already actually discussed it in the last yesterday. So uh, I think actually your talk is quite resonated with the uh, actually the last session. You know, actually what happened in Philippines and in Indonesia. Mm. And also, uh, Diana points out why actually the gender is so important, but still quite important in my opinion. Then the country agrees with that, and then uh, the function, political function of what the, the feminism is still, you know, that goes on in you know the Indonesia and Philippines, a lot of things. You know, the new population coming up is a uh, people to come. And then actually, I'm also quite uh, um, uh, impressed by your uh, talk about the, um, the, the future, of course, it's against the feminism. Of course, it, the gender rules are going to provide the drugs on and then talk about uh, how can we bring in the future. Yeah. It means the end of the present. Yeah. It's not the yeah. that actually we're going to the future. Not actually like that. We must end the present. And then that is a revolution. Hmm. So this is very uh, interesting. Uh, lots of theoretical, you know, threat is a myth. Yeah. But anyway, she very, you know, give us clear idea what we should do. And like, uh, if you like it, I would uh, put a kind of comparison to Lenin, you know, but you know, but it's bizarre, you know, like that. So that is, I think, a big question for uh, our critical theory. And then uh, also the. Um, a lot of people would really have this kind of idea, you know, but, you know, they should be done. And then at the moment, a lot of people believe that that is, I think, you know, theory of uh, theory, or theoretical mind. Okay, just so I think we uh, do, we have lots of questions and comments, so uh, I want to you know, let me have some questions and comments from the audience. Right. Yes, the professor Lee, and then, hi. Oh, thank you very much for very inspiring talk. Why I was listening to you talk about the a neoliberal temporality, I was thinking of the relationship between the neoliberal temporality and a bigger scheme of uh, historicism in terms of uh, Chakrabarati. Right. So, I mean, the, in a sense, the, the, your criticism of the a neoliberal temporality is also related with the Yogita's talk about this failure, failure state. Actually, it is also related with the, the uh, improper attitude 
in understand to understand the the, the history is the temporalization, right? In a sense, that's what the mm. temporalization has led people of anti-colonial national liberation movement guys into get into the trap mm. of the modernization and capitalism. Mm. Mm. So in the sense, a neoliberal. I'm I'm wondering if the neoliberal temporality is just part of that mm. a a a historicist temporalization of spaces, historical spaces in the course of global modernity. So what do you think about this, mm. how can I say, this mm. relationship of temporality between 21st century capitalism and neoliberal capitalism and certain a global, a, a, the historicist uh, temporalization of global modernity since 18th century? Oh. That's a big question. I think that's for you to answer, actually. You're the historian. <laughs> You're the historian. <laughs> no, I, I think I'll, uh, I'll answer with a question because it's, it's sort of um, too big for me to answer. It's, it's a very uh, important question, but I don't think I'm... Shall I speak through here? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, I, I don't think I have the capability of answering of, of the you know, um, tip of my uh, head right now. But I, um, when, when I was thinking about the question of temporality and including neoliberalism into sort of the history of uh, what I suppose is universal history, I had qualms about it. Um, because telling the story in this way also has an effect, right? Um, and so I'm the question that I asked in the end uh, of whether or not you identified with my talk, whether or not it meant something um, to you, was meant to, in a way, dissipate that effect that this, what I'm talking about, the neoliberal temporality, is in fact a universal phenomenon. So I wanted to sort of, you know, make you question. Oh, its universality. And of course, it is a way of accounting for history that then um, would, would have the opposite effect of believing in some sort of march of history, march of progress, right? I mean, I'm, I'm pessimist. I mean, I, I can't not be pessimist, given my own situation. But um, the, the narrating the story in this way also is defeatist in many ways, right? Uh, I just wanted to, I'm sorry if I had a melancholic effect on you, but what I wanted to do is to include temporality and um, not so much historicity actually, because that's a domain I don't want, I tread with caution since it's not my domain, but temporality as a constitutive factor in today's authoritarianism slash fascism. But I'd love to hear what you think about, actually, um, the historical narrative that I'm constructing, because I am doing that. Okay, that's a, that's a deal. That's a deal, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you for the great talk. Uh, there are a lot of uh, threads going on in your talk, but, um, I was thinking about what talks on both of them, and um, you kind of ended up with them during the sale of revolution. And I was thinking a lot about the situation in the United States, especially before um, Trump election. Um, because, um, you know, hmm. if I follow sort of this uh, spirit of uh, of the enemy, that there is a failed revolution behind the enemy fascism. I think there is a sense of the value of the left, uh, mm -hmm. also that the left uh, sort of inability to offer a true maybe alternative or or like I mean you touched on that sort of point a little bit that in your mm -hmm. talk how sort of the left or the elite it dissociates from everyday people and I think mm -hmm. part of Trump victory. Mm -hmm was the result of also that sort of um, sort of this liberal left or yeah. what I call sometimes the cultural left. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
and, yeah. and you know there was hope with the Bernie Sanders, but then that hope was crushed with uh, yeah. with the in the Democratic Party and, and so on. But it was so uh, there is sort of that's just sort of comment and how you see the sort of the whole move away from true economy or yeah. structural inequalities and the cultural aspects moving away from those agendas and very much obsessed with cultural issues. I think yeah. that's how I see maybe with the rise of the uh, online cultural wars you see the platforms as you know, we didn't talk a lot about it. And, and I agree with you on the point that there are some people who are not using cell phones and those come people. But in the case of the uh, United States, if you think about a lot of working class people are also fed by news outlets like Fox News. And yeah. also there are a lot of writing platforms that, that also working class people go and listen to. So these people yeah. are also like these political people come up with all using social media and all that. Yeah. So that might be leading to my maybe second <coughs> question, which is that when you say that maybe we might want to go back to this more um, in person interaction, dropping our phones, dropping social media and so on. And I get that in ethos, but at the same time, I'm wondering whether that is a bit of romantic idea, yeah. sort of going back to that pre, I don't know, social media mm. section and, and, and the thing that we can go back to the, you know, I don't know, mm. the um, open square gathering and meeting people. Is this really leading up to the scale of problems that we are Thank you. Wonderful two questions. Um, let me let me start answering by saying that I don't find the idea romantic because that's exactly what the right is doing. It is doing it. Believe me. It is exactly doing that. Going door to door, organizing as the left did in the 1960s and 70s. So I think, um, and despite the age of digital technologies and cell phones, right? Um, I think one of the problems, I mean, but, uh, let me just um, note that I don't agree with the idea that um, identity politics is just cultural. I do think that identity politics attacks also some of the uh, issues of economic exploitation that are concealed through you know, the, the criminalization of identities um, or the, you know, stigmatization of identities. And of course, the, 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 the whole conflict battle um, uh, against gender um, is, as we know, also an economic um, uh, battle. It's not just an economic battle, but it's also an economic battle. So it's not just ideological or um, identitarian in any sense. So. In that sense, I think the the uh, the left um, in the U.S. Uh, of course, you're you're referring to the U.S. The left in the U.S. has um, uh, uh, removed the economic agenda or or sort of displaced it uh, to second seat. That's true, but in Europe, it's still uh, the economic question is still alive. In Turkey, the economic question is still alive. So I think the U.S. left does not represent left politics in general. I think we shouldn't even call it left. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call it cultural, but I would call it progressive politics. Why not? I mean, let's drop the left. I mean, what's left of? Uh, but you know, um, I think there is a sense in which. In Turkey, for instance, in the absence of um, a, a correct understanding of the shifts that uh, were induced in uh, the sociology, uh, the towns, the urbanization, the the you know displacement of peoples, internal displacements, etc., the sociological setup of the country. Um, uh, Failing to understand the changes in class structure, which was, it was a question uh, just um, in um, your panel, I, I think it was your presentation when you were showing how the class structures in um, the Philippines changed. Same in Turkey. 
<coughs> so the working class uh, says diminished the industrial working class in Turkey is has diminished. Um, the increase in size is what we call small and medium term entrepreneurial type of self exploitative um, workshops, right? Uh, and these are not the working class in the classical sense, um, or the, uh, um, the the social networks have changed. Now, going to the neighborhoods does not only mean leaving the cell phones behind; it also means actually getting to have face-to-face -face interactions with those who are not in our own bubbles. Do you see? And I think without that, we cannot provide for real diagnosis, let alone come up with solutions. Um, and that's why, for instance, just as I'm giving anecdotal, uh, um, sorry about that, anecdotal sort of um, answers, but in, um, in Turkey after the earthquakes, we said, that's it, it's the end of our door. He came with an earthquake in 99 because the previous government was uh, not capable of dealing with the, the disaster. And we said, he's going with an earthquake. How symmetrical is that? Well, he didn't go with the earthquake. <laughs> now, in the earthquake zone, the, the people know that it was because of the corrupt administrations of Erdogan that handed out the contractors, you know, the, the construction permits that they didn't even control, supervise the, uh, whether the building was, um, you know, earthquake proof or whatever. People know that. It's not that it's not knowledge. And that's why I think post-truth does not mean people uh, believe in lies. They do know the truth. They do know the truth. So how come in the earthquake zones, in all of the provinces in the earthquake zones, the vote was majoritarily for Erdogan? Because the guy went to the zones, with four different housing uh, advertisements, ha advertisements with four different building projects, right? With apartments A, B, C, T, D type. And he said, choose. So he had the architectural drawings ready. And he said, I'm giving you two years of, you know, um, free. Uh, no, no um, non-payment, and then after two years, you're going to pay in 20 years installments, in 20 years. So he's selling the houses to the earthquake zones, to the, the those who are sinister. The left, center left, and that's your other question, I'm going to come to that. The the um, center sort of, um, or extreme right as, as uh, as extreme, sorry, extreme center, as Tark um, Ali puts it. <laughs> the extreme center um, leader, which was the opposition, went there and said, I'm going to give you the houses for free. People voted for Erdogan. Why? Because saying you will be giving the houses as a right because the people have the right and the state has to pay for the disaster it has caused, did not produce any effect on the people. They did not really believe that that could be the case. And it was much more efficient, you know, that the, the efficiency uh, 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 criteria was satisfied when Ard Erdogan's architects went there with projects and said, choose your apartment flat. Do you want two bedrooms, three bedrooms? And so I was, I just I wanted to say, in Turkey, for instance, the what has been left of the left is so small, it does have, you know, so few membership that going out to the neighborhoods, going out to those people, talking to them, etc., becomes physically impossible. And the rest is, as you are saying, only left in in um, as a label. It's only in, yeah, in words. Yeah, they don't have a, a a project of overcoming or addressing the root causes. And I think that's where the left failed, showing the root causes and providing for alternatives, 
that would resonate with the people. It's not what you have in mind that will resonate, right? Free does not resonate anymore. Free housing. Time is running out. Sorry, so, I've uh, talked to... One more question and then... Oh. Meeting, of course, in this session. So, uh, oh. Mark, Thank I you very much for the talk. I, I may have misunderstood part of what you were saying. But, okay. Um, but what I want to ask you is... Um, what, what happens in your thinking about unevenness? Okay. That is difference, differences among um, regions, among peoples, among states. So you've given us a conceptualization that to me sounds um, totalizing. Um, and I think it captures a lot of what's going on, but yeah. there's so much empirically that is left out of the conceptualization. Mm. So because it's a conceptualization. Yeah, it, it is a great conceptualization, oh. but I but I do wonder um, what happens if if unevenness is left out of the story. Mm. Um, and I mean, you mentioned some exa examples where the kinds of, for example, the notion of history, where past, present, and future is kind of collapsed. Um, for many people, I don't think that is the case at all. Um, and I think there are multiple ways in which history still resides in the present um, for people who have experienced war and trauma and violence. Sure. So I wonder what to make of a theory that um, seems in a way to be totalizing. I don't think maybe yeah. that is your intention, yeah. but it, it reads, it, it, when I hear it, it sounds so totalizing to me that um, there's no space for other ways of engaging with technologies. Um, there's no way to understand people, people who don't have cell phones, whose cell phones break, um, whose cell phones are, are controlled in terms of how much they can share information. Um, so I'm wondering, I guess I'm wondering, is that the right kind of theory that we need now? And what is that theory based from empirically? I mean, mm. you talked about Turkey as, as one case, and you talked about other cases. Mm. But what is the empirical basis for the you know, brilliant concepts that you presented us? Where, where does that emerge from um, in, your, in your thinking? I'm just mm. curious. Mm. Is it Europe? Is it Turkey? Is it? <sighs> Yeah, I, I yes. Um, I thought I had answered partially that question when I was um, saying, uh, you know, at the end I sort of deconstructed my own narrative, yes. right? So that was to allow for the difference you're asking for. So that's exactly because I was saying, are you identifying with my story? Then you're in my story. If not, you're not in my story. There are other stories, right? That's exactly why I did it. Right. So, of course, there are other narratives. For instance, the Kurdish population in which I work in um, uh, Turkey have a very different narrative. And of course, they're not, um, how do we say, forgetting the past. The history weighs on their present. The past tortures, the past oppression, um, and the past uh, greatness of the resistance and their struggle. Uh, the only um, issue is that they have been crushed out of existence nearly, right? And whenever they appear in the public sphere, they're branded as terrorists. So there are other mechanisms working. I mean, concepts refer or open up problems, name problems, right? So I'm, I'm opening up a problem. Now, in that problem space, you can walk empirically, that's not my domain. You can walk, you know, sociologically, anthropologically, ethnographically, or conceptually. So, um, yes, I'm theorizing. Um, my questions are the questions that the Turkish opposition poses itself. We don't have any time. We're always catching up with him. We're always responding. We're not creating anything new. We're not going ahead of him, you know, ahead of the, uh, the strongman. 
But then I find myself in conversations in which that's exactly the case also in other political settings or cultures. So that's why I would like to, mm, how to say, um, ring the bell, the alarm bells, because I think that kind of alarm bell ringing also has an awakening effect. I think it is something that we do need today, as well as stories of success. I mean, if we keep like, saying, oh, look how good we have resisted, then how do we count for the state we're in? Right, so thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will have uh, another provocateur tomorrow. Provocateur. <laughs> 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 Last week, you know, I'm quite expecting, you know, I got the uh, And then we should actually, you know, actually talk about and talk this topic out.